I'm Stuart Ellman. I'm the president-elect of the 92nd Street Y. I'm delighted to welcome you to our special event. The format, thank you, Gesundheit. The format is an interview followed by your questions. Afterwards, we will invite you to join us right outside this hall for the signing of our special guest's recent book, The Art of Being Unreasonable. Now, well, terrific title. Uh, now to tell you about our moderator, someone who needs no introduction. We all know him as the Emmy Award-winning journalist and host of Charlie Rose on PBS, America's most well-respected talk show. We also know him as a loyal and trusted friend. He first came to the 92nd Street Y in the 1980s while he was the host of CBS News Nightwatch. He spoke then on the art of conversation and has been living this art form ever since. He is the choice moderator for and good friend of many of our guests, including recently President Shimon Peres and tonight Eli, Bra Eli Broad. He shares with the 92nd Street Y many essential values, namely commitment to excellence and commitment to community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to the best of the best, Charlie Rose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, um, it's nice to be back and it's nice to be a place where we can share in your questions as well. Um, I'm gonna put this right over here. This has to do uh, with our guests. Uh, Eli Broad is a friend of mine, first of all, uh, and he should be a friend of yours. He has been, uh, he had a remarkable life in which he has now included a great portion, portion of it in this book called The Art of Being Unreasonable, uh, which is a quote from George Bernard Shaw, which said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends upon the unreasonable man from George Bernard Shaw. Uh, Eli Broad has been profiled about a year ago by my friend Morley Safer at 60 Minutes. There was a, a huge New York New Yorker profile of him that talked about his relationship to Los Angeles where uh, he has transformed the cultural community in Los Angeles and made uh, a remarkable uh, impact in terms of making Los Angeles and helping Los Angeles become really the center of contemporary art. Uh, he is a friend of many artists and, and he has a huge art collection and he plays a, more, a major role in terms of what art uh, has, rec has become uh, as a as a means uh, of bringing uh, fame to a city and recognition to a city, and he was one of the people uh, that helped bring the Disney Hall to fruition designed by Frank Gehry. It's been a remarkable life. Now look at the cover of this book, which you can't see. Uh, what you see on the right is, is the rabbit, the famous rabbit by Jeff Koons, and we'll talk about all of that. Uh, this is a man who made a lot of money, uh, both in terms of, of a company called Kaufman and Broden and also a company called Sun America, which they sold, and we'll talk about that. It gave him the resources to look at philanthropy in a really smart way. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Eli Broad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is so much to talk about with him, and I, but I want to start uh, by talking about uh, something we're all concerned about, which is having talked about the introduction of the book. We'll talk about the book, we'll talk about business, and we'll talk about you know, the lessons that he has learned in this book. Uh, some of the things that have to do with being um, a person who's always looking to the future and is always curious, and, and it is uh, a treatise, I think, in terms of his life and, and what he says here on, on the art of making sure you're going forward and the art of negotiations as well. But I want to first turn uh, to some current topics. Uh, how are we doing in the economic recovery? I think we have a slow recovery. Not as robust as we had hoped. No, I, I hope it picks up some steam. I don't think we're gonna have a double dip. A uh, lot to worry about, especially Europe, yeah. and what effect it's gonna have on us. Uh, um, everybody that I talked to, I just came from um, Omaha, Nebraska today, where uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger talked about Berkshire Hathaway, and, and Warren Buffett one more time uh, made the clear point that uh, this recovery will never be uh, robust until housing recovers. Exactly. That's a business you know well. So where are we in terms of housing 
getting back to where it was and leading the American economic recovery? I think it's going to be a good year to 18 months before we see more housing starts. We've got to clean up all these foreclosed homes that are on the market, and that's starting to happen. Foreclosures are starting to slow down somewhat. Uh, apartment building is rather robust right now because psychology's changed. People would rather rent than own. So I think we'll see housing starts pick up at the end of 2013. And, but, but some people are, are buying the, into the foreclosures and then renting the property. Exactly. And they see, they see uh, these prices so low, they see uh, appreciation that will be dramatic in the next three to five years mm -hmm. in certain markets. Let me turn to this book and, and talk about that and then talk about your life. Uh, there is, uh, I think, something that your wife gave you that sits on your desk in Los Angeles. That's correct. Tell me the story of that. Well, after we were married several years, she uh, got this George Bernard, Bernard uh, Shaw quote, Shaw quote that, that she'd mentioned and gave it to me. It's been sitting on my desk for 50 years now. The title she knows being, me better than anyone, <laughs> so uh, uh, using the term unreasonable uh, is one that uh, she's thought about from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have it. She, this is, I, I think she's here, and I'll ask her to stand up later. But she uh, is. The, there, this is a remarkable woman, and, and just for the sake of, of, of understanding that, I want to read the dedication <laughs> of this book. Uh, to Edie, the love of my life, that simple. Uh, so we'll introduce her when we take questions from the audience as well. Um, the title fits you, Michael Bloomberg said, maybe in the back of this book. Michael Bloomberg, uh, not on the back of this book, but basically said, that you are an unreasonable man, uh, and that being unreasonable has served you well. Tell me how you define unreasonable. You know what? I don't think I'm unreasonable. Well, other, other people think I'm unreasonable because I'm so demanding. Well, and, and do you think all of us should be demanding, and, and that should be reasonable, not unreasonable. And, 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 and I get involved in things that people think can't be done. You mentioned Walt Disney Concert right. Hall. It was dead, ready to be buried. But I, together with my friend Dick Rudin and Mayor, said we can't let that happen. People said it would never be built. So we're proud of that. And I've done a number of other things that people thought uh, yeah. didn't make sense. More in the business community or more in the cultural community? Uh, in both, actually. Really? Uh, in business, for example, when we started uh, home building in Michigan, uh, all homes had basements. I was a young CPA. Yeah. Graduate that, of Michigan State. That lasted two years, and I said, uh, gee, all these clients are making a lot of money home building. I can do that. So I went to Ohio and saw all these homes being built without basements. So we came up with a home without a basement with a carport, and it was an immediate success. And there's another part of this story, too. You went to Edie's father and borrowed the initial capital. $12,500, that's correct. And, and, and then you went to a fellow by the name of Kaufman, so Kaufman and Broad became mm -hmm. the company. Exactly, he was 10 years my senior. He knew something about building. So what is the lesson of that? I think the lesson of that is to do research, not accept conventional wisdom, question everything, and ask why not? Yeah. That was from Shaw, too. Some people see things as they are and ask why. Others see things as mm -hmm. they aren't and ask why not. So there's nothing like research. There's nothing like asking why not when people say, oh, it hasn't been done, it's not going to work, and so on. So that made you a rich man. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then uh, uh, you decided that you weren't going to start just one business, but you were going to start a second business. And so you acquired Sun. We acquired Sun Life Insurance right. Company of America in 1971. It was founded in 1890 in Baltimore. Uh, we owned it for a few years, and I said, you know what? We've got to find a market niche. Right. And we went into retirement savings and changed the name to Sun America. And that turned out to be a great success. And, and we did a number of things here that ours didn't do. And sold it in 1999 to AIG for $18 billion. That's correct. Now, <laughs> let me, that's a good deal. Uh, <laughs> let, let, me, let me go back and back, back, back to sort of this. So, so you came to, you were born in the South Bronx. Right? I was. Your father moved to Detroit? 
They moved to Detroit uh, at the beginning of World War II without my consent. Yes. They were Lithuanian immigrants. They were, exactly, both. You're an only child. I'm an only child. How has that shaped you? Well, I am too, so I'm anxious to hear There are pluses and minuses in being an only child. Uh, Makes you independent. I I think it has made me independent. Mm -hmm. And my parents both worked, so I was fairly independent by myself. He ran five and ten stores. Yeah, he he had two. He started actually here as a house painter. Then he became a merchant, uh, and then uh, he opened two five and tens, five and uh, ten, ten cent stores, stores yeah. in De- Michigan, in Detroit. Uh, and and you, why did you decide on Michigan State? Well, frankly, I, I, I'm a product of Detroit Central High School. My wife's a product of Detroit Mumford High School, and uh, visited the campus, liked it very much. It was very diverse, which I liked. We'll talk about philanthropy more, but you now have uh, a building there named after you that you have. Yeah, we've got the group. Zaha Hadid is building one of them. Yeah, a a museum opening in September. What else at Michigan State? Well, they renamed the uh, business college, and I created the uh, graduate school of management with my name on it and endowed that. So after you sold Sun America to, and, and, and there are all kinds of public notes of, of, <laughs> of being at least five or six billion dollars worth, uh, did you decide that that was enough? I stayed on for a couple of years and then decided uh, I need a fourth career. First was public accounting, then it was home building, then it was uh, Sun America. Finance, yeah. And uh, decided to... Uh, get more engaged in philanthropy. And, 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 and when thinking about that, I said, what's the biggest problem South, uh, facing America? Having traveled to Asia, whether it was China, Japan, India, Korea, uh, I felt they were doing a far better job educating their children than we were. So the first thing we got involved in heavily was education reform about 11 years ago. Yeah. Most of the philanthropy today is, is in three areas, and I brought these these are books about the Broad Foundation, uh, education, mm-hmm. uh, science, and yes. medicine, and the arts. Exactly. Yeah. When did you move to, to L.A.? We moved to L.A. in 1963. And thinking, why, did, why L.A.? Well, we started a company in Michigan. Michigan was a rather volatile housing market. And the first place we moved for two years was Arizona. And then we, we finally headquartered in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. which was the biggest housing market in America. And, and, and then later, you, you obviously you went into philanthropy, but LA, um, you have become, I think the most prominent and, and the most, certainly the person who's had the most influence on, on Los Angeles today. And, and you can read a whole series of, of profiles of you that suggest that. How did you get involved in the city? What, who led you to say, you know, we need you, and this is an important way for you to give back. You know, Los Angeles is a great meritocracy. You can come there without the right family background, the right religion, the right politics. And if you have ideas and are willing to work, you're accepted. Yeah. But you were not then an art collector. No, Edie was the first art collector. I got involved in art collecting, like, yeah. in 1972. Yeah. Is there, there's a famous story about Edie, which is that uh, she would go down a La Hacienda, wasn't it? Mm-hmm, exactly. And, and went into the galleries and, and in fact saw a uh, famous soup can. soup can from Warhol. Mm-hmm. Uh, and well, you pick up the story. And uh, I think it was $100 and so on. And uh, she thought if she spent $100 on this soup can of Andy Warhol, uh, I'd come back from a trip and uh, be very upset. So she didn't do it. She didn't do it. How much was it? About $100, I believe. And then later there was, fast (laughs) forward, how many, 20, 25 years, there was an auction. Mm -hmm. uh, And you're bidding on an Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the price has gotten to what? Uh, A little over $10 million. $10 million. (laughs) (laughs) And And it was a torn soup can. (laughs) (laughs) And so Edie whispers to, when, when she realizes what the, price is and what somebody had bid, she whispers into uh, Eli's <laughs> ear, 
what idiot bought that, <laughs> not knowing that her husband had just bought it, right? That's, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. <laughs> but there was a guy named, who was, a, I think, a vice president, Todd Schreiber, was that his name? Jack Schreiber, yes, yeah. of MCA. He had a real influence. He was a vice president on he you. He did. He was a good friend. Um, Taft introduced me to lots of uh, art museums, art dealers, yeah. some artists, and so on. He was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And your earliest collections had, were, were Picasso and Modigliani? The earliest thing we bought was a, a Van Gogh, uh, a Van Gogh draw, right. drawing. And then we uh, bought uh, Picasso. We bought a large mural from 1933, a uh, work of Matisse from the 20s, and so on. We kept yeah. some of that. Yeah. But you shifted your focus. We did. We moved forward in time. and. Uh, got involved in contemporary art, and we love it. It's not simply acquiring objects. It's a, it's a great educational experience. Being with artists and that whole art world, it's uh, opened up all sorts of addition. Why to, contemporary art? Well, it's art of our times. Yeah. And if you go through history, the great collections have been built uh, several years after the work was done. Yeah. And, and am I right in believing that our Los Angeles has become the center in the world of contemporary art? It has in the following ways. We've got more great art schools than any other city in America. We've got a great population of working artists who are now accepted. At one time, if you weren't in New York, you weren't accepted. Uh, and then we've got more gallery space and museums for contemporary art than any city. Between the Hammer Museum, the Broad Contemporary Art Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, in a new museum we're building. The, the Broad Collection. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how many of the boards of those institutions have you at one time or another served on? Well, I was a founding chairman of Museum of Contemporary Art. I'm now a life trustee. I'm a life that trustee of uh, LA County Museum. Yeah. I was a region Smithsonian, which has 18 museums yeah. for a number of years. And I'm a life trustee in Museum of Modern Art here in New York. And, and you're also a trustee of work, one time a trustee of UCLA, which the hammer went to. I, I was, exactly. Yeah. So Los Angeles uh, today has a newspaper that some people <laughs> say you may want to buy. It's called the Los Angeles Times. I believe the Los Angeles Times needs local ownership, and it ought to be owned by a group of wealthy families or foundations. And one of these days, the creditors uh, are going to want to sell it, and hopefully uh, a number of uh, foundations or wealthy individuals will want to own it. When will that day be? I don't know. It's been going on for three years as bankruptcy. Yeah. In the next year or so. It's also this part of the was part of the Chicago Tribune, was it not? Yes, yes. Sam Zell and all that. Yeah, all that. Well, what so, a story. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's a phrase that rolls off my tongue now, all that and all that matters. <laughs> Uh, so when you look at, when you look at the, why would somebody want to own a newspaper in today's environment? You wouldn't want to own it uh, for investment purposes. You, you'd want to own it as a, as a public trust. Yeah, like the Guardian is owned by a public trust. Actually. It is indeed. Is that a model that you might? Mm, something like that. And also you have the paper in uh, Florida. What is it? Uh, St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg. Uh, the Guardian, oh. St. Petersburg. Yeah, and, and some uh -huh. have suggested that it, it ought to be a model for, for a lot of other good newspapers around. You know, the I Boston, it, Globe, I, Boston Globe was owned by the New York Times. They, you know, that's run under the Philadelphia Inquirer. All of them have run into to tough economic times. And the question always is, will local people step forward you know, in some new economic model and buy them for the good well, of the community? Mm, I hope uh, things turn around for America's newspapers. It's been tough. Beyond the economic recovery, uh, do you worry about America's competitive position because of public education, because I of scientific research? I certainly do. Remember, we used to be number one in the world in graduation. Uh, it's been 28 years since A Nation at Risk was uh, published. Just two weeks ago, the Council of Foreign Relations came out with a report. Was, during, was that during the, what year was that, when the Nation at Risk was published? Uh, 28 years ago, yeah, which was, was what? About <laughs> 83. 83. Yeah. Two weeks ago, the Council of Foreign Relations came out with a report saying that education was a, uh, 
uh, national security priority. And that 70% of people, 18 to 24, were not fit to serve in the military. That was astounding. And we can't live with that. And then, of course, in math, we're down the 20s in science versus other countries. We've got to turn that around. And how do we do it? With great difficulty, but how do we do it? I think we've got great teachers in America, but we've got a system that's broken. Governance, you've got 14, 15,000 school boards competing with national education ministries. Uh, you have too much money spent outside of the American classroom. In other countries, you spend 90% in the classroom. Here it's like 50 or 60%. The rest is spent on bureaucracies, this, that, and the other thing. We need a longer school day, a longer school year. Uh, we've got to find better teaching. We've got to reward teachers. Uh, our kids only get 720 hours of academics a year. You've funded a lot of charter schools. We do, we do. More than 100. Uh, probably about 100. Yeah. Well, if you include KIPP Academy, which right, alone right, has 110 right, right, or right. so, so it's probably closer to 200 if you include and, that. And what's going on at Cambridge? And, and where are we in terms of medical research and understanding the possibilities that we learn from mapping the human gen uh, genome? We got involved in science uh, really opportunistically. I was on the board of Caltech. Uh, David Baltimore was right. president, who is a good friend now. Former president of the Rockefeller. Exactly. Uh, and uh, he introduced me Eric Lander in October of 01. Wonderful man. And uh, Eric was decoding the human genome for the government. I said, when are you gonna be done? He says, April of 03. Then what, Eric? He says, I want to start an institute to take all we've learned and get it to clinical application. Uh, so I said, what do you need? He says, I need $800 million. <laughs> I said, I hope you get it somewhere. <laughs> he didn't. But then, then I stayed in touch, and I said, you know what? Our foundation will put up $100 million over 10 years if Harvard and MIT will do likewise. And I must tell you, that was quite a negotiation because Harvard and MIT have never partnered in anything before. Uh, and that started six and a half years ago, and it's been a great success. Okay, but that's 300 million by my accounting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do we have 500 to go, or? Well, we ended up giving them another 100, and then after four. us. Four. That's four. And, and then we ended up giving them another $400 million, <laughs> payable over a number of years, <laughs> to create hopefully a billion dollar endowment. Yeah. So let me talk about philanthropy as you see it. Wasn't it Carnegie who says a man who died, or anyone who dies with their, when a wealthy person dies with their wealth intact, they die in shame. That's right, I, I agree with that. I also agree, he who gives while he lives also knows where it goes. Which is a good <laughs> idea to start giving. So are you part of the giving pledge? Oh, yes, I was one of the first, uh, yeah, I remember. Now, why is that a good idea? I think it's a good idea. It sets an example for others, and hopefully others will want to do the same thing. And I think what Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and David Rockefeller did was great. I still recall the first meeting at Rockefeller University when we all did that. Yeah, indeed. Well, it was with David. Didn't David host the meeting or something? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, you also bring to bear, and, and tell me what your philosophy is, business analytical methods to the giving of money? Well, I think philanthropy is different than charity. Charity to me is writing checks. We, we've done a lot of that and continue to do that. But philanthropy to me is, 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 is getting involved and, and not only providing the financial resources but perhaps intellectual capital. And I've been blessed to have many great people at our foundation that uh, young, very bright people in the last 10, 12 years that get out there and do things. Mm -hmm. And most, like 90% of what we do, Charlie, are, are things that we, we, we find ourselves. And we've got three criteria. If it's gonna happen anyway, we don't get involved. Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, make a difference 20 or 30 years from now. And lastly, are there people there that can make it happen? So uh, in education, uh, Science you mentioned, the Berlin Institute yeah. in genomics. Performing arts. You know. and, and the visual arts and a bit in the performing arts and the like. Yeah. 
tell me, uh, uh, because of your philanthropic involvement, what's your vision for Los Angeles? I think Los Angeles is a great city that I owe, owe quite a bit to and want to give back. And it developed very different than any other cities. Los Angeles did not have a vibrant center. There was a number, I still remember flying in, someone said, look at a one big Queens. Or they said, uh, 100 <laughs> cities trying to find a, a suburb trying to find a city. Yeah. And it's finally happening. In the last 12 years, we've gone from 2 million people a year coming downtown to like 15 million, and that's accelerating. Population downtown has doubled in the last 10 years. I think it's gonna double again in the next five to 10 years. You have a weak mayor system, don't you? We have a weak mayor system. Uh, I wish we had a system similar in New York or Chicago. Yeah. And, and what about education? How much influence does the mayor have on education? He has some, but you've got an elected school board yeah. as compared to Boston, Chicago, New York, Washington, which uh, mayors have control of the schools. Mm -hmm. I looked at where people give it money to. You know this better than I do, but I'll just, this is what I remember. Um, the, the universities and foundations get a lot of money from people, I guess. Uh, then hospitals get a lot. Uh, art gets a lot, museums, mm -hmm. uh, varying degrees. Social services don't get much. Uh, that's true. Why is that? I think people, universities get money from their graduates and the like, hospitals, uh, medical centers get money from grateful patients. Um, uh, I, I can't answer your question. Mm -hmm. I, I think human services uh, uh, ought to get more money. In terms of Los Angeles, you want to create uh, a kind of miracle mile for Los Angeles, where you'll have the <laughs> same thing we do. We have a museum mile here uh, from the Guggenheim all the way down <laughs> uh, to MoMA. Uh, including with the Whitney, including um, the Met, mm -hmm. um, is it? Are you going? Is that dream within reach? Well, I got involved on Grand Avenue when I was a founding chairman of the Museum of Contemporary Art in 1979. And what's happened in recent years is we now have an arts high school there, right. by Wolf Pree. It's like uh, a school for the performing arts. Yes, yes, and I. That happened as a result of my visiting the LaGuardia School for the Arts right, near Lincoln right, Center, right. the famed school. Los Angeles didn't have such a school. So on the same street within three blocks, we've got three venues in the Music Center, now the fourth venue, Walt Disney Concert right. Hall. Uh, we've got the Colburn School of Music, and now we're building the Broad Museum there. 